Hello, everyone. I hope you had a chance to get away for a great lunch. We're going to kick off this afternoon with our next session, How to Benefit from Internal Audit. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Williamson. I work for GSK. We are a biopharma organization, global. I lead the internal audit function for cybersecurity and data privacy. But first, let me just say, uh, it's a real privilege to be talking at RSA. I'm really looking forward to this conference. So we're going to talk about how to benefit from internal audits. Now, first of all, uh, let me say, internal audit exists to serve the board of directors. We provide assurance that all the business risks are well managed and under control. Now, over the last five, six, seven years, cyber threats have caused the cyber risk to escalate up to the top business risk of most organizations. It certainly isn't our organization and many of uh, our peer organizations. And this has had an impact in internal audit because we've had to transform ourselves, really upskill, improve our capabilities and change our processes so that we are giving reliable and accurate assurance that the cyber threats are being well managed. So what I want to do today, I want to virtually teleport you into the world of internal audit. Give you a feel for how we work and how we think about security. Okay, standard disclaimer, the one thing I'll point out, I'm going to use some examples which seem realistic. They're actually fictitious. Don't, 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 don't take away saying that they <laughs> this is a GSK situation. I've tried to create something realistic but fictional. So let me just take two minutes or so just to, just to describe where internal audit sits in the organization. This is a common governance model, the three lines of defense. The first line is the system admins, the engineers, the help desk, the software engineers, everyone who does the work. Hopefully they're doing the thing securely because they've embedded controls into their processes. The second line is typically the CISO organization and the GRC organization. They create standards and policies and implement controls. They create key risk indicators and monitor for compliance. They do everything to make sure that we continually stay secure with relevant controls. Now, internal audit, we are independent. As I say, we're accountable to the board of directors. We do partner quite well with the CISO organization. That's an important uh, partnership. But fundamentally, we're expected to provide a, an informed opinion that's balanced, uh, proportionate, and basically tells the board, yeah, the organization is managing the risk well, or, you know, there's some big gaps here. You know, you need to do something here. Your money's not being well spent. Okay, so the board really do rely on us for that independence. So in terms of what internal audit look for, it's all about threats and controls. Do you really understand the threat environment. So I'm talking to the security organization here, the rest of the, the IT organization. Do you understand the threats we're facing now? And do you have controls which are fit for purpose and mitigate those threats? You never bring the risk down to zero. That's certainly not what we expect. But essentially, you really need to have a good idea of the threats and the strength of your control environment. And also, if you're reporting the status of risk back to senior management and board, are your risk estimates accurate? Are you giving them a true picture of your risk? Have you properly calculated the risk based on facts and data? So we go in and we do that sort of thing. The sort of audits we do, an audit, an audit might last six to eight weeks. Sometimes we'll do end-to-end -end process audits say vulnerability, management, software patching, look at it end to end. We may do a full in-depth system audit, say SAP, full technology stack security audit. 
Or you may go into the business, much closer to the business, look at some of their data flows, some of their business applications, pick out the suppliers, look, ha have you identified the critical data and are you really protecting it against exfiltration? So different types of audits we do. I'll, c I'll come into some examples during this presentation. <coughs> right, uh, next one. Can we keep pace with the rate of change? Okay. So I've been working in IT for over 30 years now. With pauses for you to say, gosh, are you really that old? Back in the day when I was a software developer, things, was, things were much more straightforward. We would build client-server applications, standardization with a database backend, perhaps Oracle, and we'd have a front-end application running in a desktop. And guess what? People come into the office, and the only interface to the system, the database, was the desktop application. So you had a nice little perimeter there. Of course, pace of change, it's evolved to un unrecognizably now. The key difference is we are much, much more distributed now. Okay? You've got cloud services, you've got managed services, you've got software as a service. Uh, you, know, you might protect your perimeter and that's good, but if half your assets are outside your network, then they're, they're exposed. You've got much more diversity of technology as well. Whereas previously there was a heavy focus on standardization. You know, let's stick to Unix, let's stick to Oracle, let's stick to Microsoft desktops, whatever. Very, very different now. You want a database, okay, on the cloud, where well, you can use Cloud SQL for standard databases, or Cloud Spanner if you want something much more global. You want a data lake, okay, build it using BigQuery and create some data pipelines. You can even port your SQL Server or Oracle stuff in there as well. So, so many varieties of technology. Okay. Now, I can go on and on here, and I will do a little bit more. So, business processes are becoming increasingly digitized and data-driven. So, for example, in our organization, we do clinical trials for potential new drugs. Previously, patients would come into a clinic Symptoms would be monitored and entered into the system and analysed. Now they've got mobile apps. They enter the, they enter the symptoms in there. There's so many business processes. We've got much, much more data now. The data flow is driving them. Now some of those data flows, like the one I just described, think about that data. It's highly confidential and it's integrity critical because it's safety. But that's just another job for security to do. So, ultimately, we have a much, much expanded attack surface. Cybercrime is a lucrative business, and we've given the bad actors many more points of attack. Oh, and by the way, users' expectations are greater now. They want high availability, minimum downtime, and they want faster delivery of solutions. And we just have to take care of security. Does this resonate with, with people? See some heads nodding. So what we have is a large distributed attack surface, a diverse range of technology platforms, and exponential data growth. Okay. What you find is the security organization have found themselves in this infinite loop whereby new technology comes along update the policies, update the standards, implement the new controls, then something else new comes along. So what we need to do is we need to find a way of being pragmatic and more efficient because a compliance method of implementing lots of controls just doesn't scale up. In recent years, we've focused, we've gone much, much more into threat-based security, threat-based assurance. So, you think about controls, I said, we talk a lot about controls. Uh, common control libraries are CIS, it's the one I favour, there's NIST, there's PCI, there is, there's a number there. I take the view that, you know, they all cover the same stuff, just in different frameworks. So, I take the view of, you, you choose one and you do it very, very well. 
Alex CIS, and we rely on it a lot. And what you find is they have guidance for implementing this control library. You've got three implementation groups. Group one is the basic ones, you implement these controls. And group two is another set of controls you implement. Then another set of controls you implement too. But as I said, with so much change, so much more technology, so much more data, it, it doesn't really scale up very well. We need a more pragmatic way of getting better security that doesn't rely on blindly implementing controls. And that's where the threat-based approach comes in. What we do here is we identify the threats and we identify the controls that mitigate those threats and implement them and make sure they work. I'd like to summarise it in terms of protecting our most valuable assets against our most likely threats. Okay? So some, it's a bit of a shift for some people. You know, it's away from compliance, much more to threats. There's implied risk acceptance here. Well, you're going to have risk whatever way you do it. You, you know, if you take a full compliance approach, that could be a multi-year program to implement that. You know, that's, that's way too long. You need to prioritise based on your biggest threats. What I find is, within an industry, companies will have the same threats. Across industries, there's different threats. So companies that work in do a lot of research and development, a lot of intellectual property. They have slightly different threats to, say, an e-commerce retail company. Sure, everyone's scared of ransomware, but other threats are, are different. And that kind of drives the prioritization in terms of selecting controls that you need to implement. So as I said, it's all about threats and controls. And what I want to do is actually walk you through some, some worked examples. I sometimes use threat and loss event interchangeably. There's a slight difference in that one. When I say a loss event or loss event scenario, what I mean is it's a threat. It's, it's a threat actor, is a sequence of events, a sequence of exploits, and it results in some damage to the organization. Okay? A threat is somebody's got in there, breached your defenses, but the actual end damage has not yet occurred. Slight nuance there. But anyway, so let, let's talk about loss event scenarios. Okay, so there's always a threat agent there. Very rarely is it a single exploit that's caused a breach. It's normally a sequence of exploits. And that means you normally have to have a control set to defend against a, a certain loss event. So here's an example loss event. Uh, you should have. That's it. <coughs> okay, so you. Let's say the company's done a bit of work. They've seen this happen to other companies before. You know, maybe it's carelessness. And, and they, 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 they see it as a, yeah, it's a genuine threat here. And they've assessed it a, on, on a scale. This is something that, that needs, to be, needs to be mitigated. This is where you go one step further and say, okay, what controls will work against this threat? A control is anything that can be used to reduce the frequency or the magnitude of loss. Preventive, detective, response controls, different types of technology, there's people, process, physical and, and legal. More and more, I think the more we can use technology controls and automation, the better. And I'll explain that, that a bit more. We can start using people and processes well, you're never going to get away from that. There'll always be people and processes in, in there as, as well. But uh, we did, there's human error catches in there. So there's a couple of examples. Multi-factor authentication is a technology control. It's used to help prevent unauthorized access. Very, very good control. It's not 100% uh, secure. There's many ways of hacking it, but it raises the level of difficulty for the bad actor, and that's what you want to do with controls. Make it much more difficult. Another control would be, let's say, static source code analysis tool. 
you implement that into your software development process, that will quickly find insecure code as it's been developed. Great tool, great tool, but you rely on people and process to ensure that, ensure that those vulnerabilities are fixed and the insecure code does not get promoted into production. I thought of another example of a control this morning when I got up out of bed. <clears throat> I, when you spend the afternoon sitting on the top deck of an open top tourist bus, factor 30 lotion is a very good control to prevent sunburn. I kind of messed up there yesterday. <clears throat> so my key message here is going to focus on controls. What, what, what different types of controls? You can't just throw lots of controls in there. We, we can't afford to. And we talk about controls. They should be relevant, reliable, and reasonable. If people use FAIR, a uh, FAIR risk management methodology, relevant and reliable relates to a intended performance and operational performance. Other methodologies say it's control design and control implementation. Okay. Relevant means yet it's relevant to the threat or mitigate that threat. And reliable means it actually works in practice. I'll come on to reasonable uh, shortly. So I want to work through an example. So two more loss event scenarios. Both of them involve uh, insiders. Let me talk about insiders for a moment. When I say I talk about an insider, it could be a regular employee, could have gone rogue, or it could have been an employee who's just made a mistake. Okay, it's an insider breach. It could be an employee from a trusted third party who do processing for us. Or it could be a bad actor who's got credentials and is masquerading as a regular employee on the network. So there are many types of insider threat. Essentially, it's someone who is authenticated onto the system or onto the network. So two scenarios here. So here's a control matrix, list of controls. So I've got loss event one, loss event two. I've got a list of controls here, possible controls here. The numbers beside it are the reference from CIS. So I've taken most of these from the CIS control library. Okay, I think I, think I mentioned the CIS controls. Uh, There's 18 controls decomposed into 153 safeguards, I think. Now take a moment or two just to look at these and think about which ones are relevant to each scenario, as in we'll mitigate the threats. And also think about how, how, you, how you might test these for reliability. Take a few moments there. <clears throat> so here's what I've, I've put down. Nowadays, within, especially with insiders, security awareness amongst the workforce is essential. But it does nothing to mitigate the malicious insider. You might even help them. In a way. By, by definition, the malicious insider does not follow policy, controls, or guidance. If the, if the training is effective, if it's engaging, then yeah, it does mitigate the, 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 the risk of a accidental data breach, breach, an accidental incident. There's something there. Data loss prevention is a wonderful technology, uh, essential these days, if it's been configured correctly. It should work well. If you've got supporting processes behind it, so you set the right thresholds and people and process are there to act on the alerts it throws up, it's, a, it's, a very, it's an essential, essential technology. So we've got a question mark next to reliability. That's something we need to test. It's certainly relevant for detecting or preventing data exfiltration. Multi-factor authentication, well, loss, loss event one, they not relevant. They're, they're in already, come to encryption, they've, they've got authorised access. The MFA for loss event two, and, and in this case, it would, have, it would have helped greatly for that situation. 
you know, I would, I would hopefully have prevented uh, the, 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 the bad actor getting onto the weak access controlled storage area. There's one uh, here, document all data flaws. This, this is a control. Well, it's not really a control. Think back to our te technology footprint, our digital footprint. Think of all these digital channels and all these data flaws. Can you imagine trying to document all those? No, that's not control. That, that's an industry in itself. That one there, okay, it might be useful, but it's unreasonable. It's going to consume an awful lot of resource to document all the data flaws and keep them up to date where there's so much change going on. So a big question mark on the reasonableness of that one. Now let's talk about reliability. So this is something internal audit do, really do really have to do well, is test the effectiveness of these controls. Do they actually work? And one of my favorite techniques is what I call misuse case testing. So look, we're looking at data exfiltration here, data loss. So a misuse case will create, say, seven, eight, nine, ten scenarios. One would be, let's download some sensitive data from a key system, put it in a spreadsheet, and email it to a personal account. Let's grab some sensitive documents from a team site. I'll use my bring your own device. I'll see my mobile phone, if you like. I'll see if I can tr transmit it using WhatsApp or some other consumer device elsewhere. Let's see if we can upload a document into a personal cloud storage bucket. So you get, get see where I'm going here, I create all these misuse scenarios. And we test them, okay? And what you do there is you're testing a whole range of controls, okay? In a good situation, when we do this, the alerts would come and people would come knocking on our doors and saying, okay, security alert here, stop this. And that, that's good, that's, that, that proves things are working. But what can go wrong? I, maybe the DLP's not being configured correctly. Maybe we found a way, maybe we found the thresholds and said, okay, if we do say 10 documents at a time, it won't flag it up. Or maybe, the, maybe an analyst in the SOC has not acted on an alert. A lot of the time you're find, trying to find this needle in a haystack. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. But that's what we do when we test for reliability. We really try and, there's no point ticking the box saying we've implemented DLP. Okay, that's, that's fine. It doesn't tell us if it's working. So I'll come back to this shortly and give some suggestions for a perhaps an improved control set. The five by five risk matrix is commonly used across many organisations for likelihood and impact of risk. It's sometimes criticised for its lack of precision in risk estimation. But I would argue that when you've got, when you're looking at risk across the enterprise, many risk areas, it provides a level of abstraction that's pragmatic and still meaningful. Okay? You have some definitions of each, of each measure, one to five, which helps. But it helps compare risks across the different types of risks and different types of impact if you've got reputational impact legal impact financial loss patient safety impact it's very useful for that now what we've shown here is inherent risk and residual risk so inherent risk is where we are currently this is a looking at this you scope the threats the inherent risk is okay we've got some controls in place we've done some audit testing we find they're not as effective as they should be and we're quite, we're quite exposed. So look, we've got a high risk here. Residual risk is where we want to be. Okay? You never get it down to zero. You know, no point kidding ourselves there. But by implementing controls that are relevant and reliable, you'll close that gap. And that should be the aim. So here's an alternative control set. What I've done is a, I've added four controls, removed one control, and modified another. Let me talk about training first of all. So you see there's two things there about training. For training to be effective, it's got to be engaging, but it's got to really target the threat. 
So one of the sub controls in CIS is train people on unauthorized data exposure. Of course, they make so you, you've got something specific there, and make it engaging. Gamification is a fantastic technique. I love that. Then you got another one down below 14.6. A second one from the bottom. Train the workforce on recognizing and reporting security incidents. Now remember I said, training generally policies are not going to mitigate the malicious insider. Well, if you train your workforce to recognize suspicious activity and report it, and not be, don't be scared of reporting it, then that's a control in itself. So that's another, another aspect of training I would focus in on there. And let's go one step further. How, how do we test training? Okay. A lazy way to test training is to look at the completion list on your online training system and tick off, oh yes, 95% complete, tick the box. Well, okay, you have to do that, but it doesn't tell you if your training's making a difference. It just tells you that people have completed the training. What you want to do is find out, has it made a difference? So on the one, training people to report security incidents. Let's say you train your workforce to report any instance of personal information being leaked out of the company or personal information being disclosed in some way. You describe it, you train them, you tell them how to report it. As an auditor, I would want to go to the security incident log and see how that's changed. If we find that uh, over a period of a few months, reported incidents have gone from say five or six a month to 500 a month, then that tells me the training is effective. Now, okay, there may be 95% false positives there, but you've really made a difference. It's a bit like phishing training as well, phishing simulations. What you're looking at is click rate. If you find over a period the, click, the average click rate for your workforce is coming down, then you know your training's effective. So as auditors, that's what we look at. You know, we have to sort of see, is, is it making a difference? You know, okay, you're nice flashy training and things, that's, I love it, but let, let, let's, let's find something that, that helps tell us that it's money well spent. <coughs> uh, what else have we got? Oh, data loss prevention. Added a control there, enforced data classification. So think of the volume of data we're dealing with in our organizations just now. You know, it's, it's just, it's a big data situation. But if you enforce data classification and tune the DLP so that it knows when something sensitive is going out, you have much better chance of detecting it and stopping it. Mm. Another one I put down there is a document critical data flows. That's much more reasonable. And it helps DLP and it helps with data governance generally. Okay, there's lots and lots of data there. I don't really care about it. <laughs> we, we, should, we shouldn't be investing lots of money on trivial data. We should really focus on the most sensitive data, whether it's integrity critical or confidentiality trickle, A critical. So I, I, as you can see, I, by going through this analysis, understanding the threat, doing a bit of thinking on how does this control mitigate the threat? Then doing some realistic testing, valuable testing that tells you if it's reliable and effective. You get to a much better control environment. Sometimes that means taking controls out or reducing controls. Once again, it's quite lazy just to add, continually add controls, thinking you're improving. Very often you will not. It's getting this optimum set. Something else is important is uh, assessing the likelihood of a loss event. And uh, there the are many formal methods for doing, for doing this. You always need data. You always need some sort of threat intelligence. But what a good starting point is to do this threat agent profile. Along the top, you identify the threat communities that are most likely to attack you. Okay, this might vary between organizations and vary across industries. But what we do is there's certain factors we need to consider. What is the motive? What are they really after? What is the capability of these people? Are they highly skilled? And there's 
nation state or cybercrime gangs. They've got high capability. Personal risk tolerance and past occurrence. Has it happened before in your company? Has it happened to other companies in the same industry? Or has it, has it happened wider? These give, you, these, these give you some good information to make an informed assessment of likelihood. There's some very good breach reports out there. You know, the Verizon's a commonly used one. There's one such as the Microsoft Cloud Data Breach Report that I read recently, which is excellent. There's also, some also threat intelligence services as well, which can feed data in. So you always have to, it's, ve it's very easy just to see high risk, high risk, highlight that you, you need some data to back up your judgment on this one. The reasonableness. Reasonableness is a term used a lot by regulators, used a lot by lawyers and contracts. So it's a complicated <laughs> issue. I can't possibly do it justice in, in here, but I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to just touch on the key, the key principle here. And the key principle is the cost of the control should not exceed the value of the risk reduction it gains. When I say cost, there's financial cost, the price of the technology, the price of the resource, but very often the main cost is user frustration and loss of productivity. So remember, we have to act in the best interest of the organisation. The organisation needs to innovate, they need to spend money on marketing, they need to develop new products out there. We need, to bear, we need to bear that in mind and we need to enable the workforce to work effectively. So reasonableness is very important. Okay, you always, there's always a balance here. Going back to controls, technology controls and automation, uh, again the more we, can, more we can use that, the more likely we're going to improve security without overburdening the, the workforce. Security by design. Now, we've got to deliver solutions quickly. Cloud services allow us to do that. They're fantastic. You can spin up a database in a couple of minutes. You can do server serverless. You can connect things. It's fantastic. It's very easy to get things wrong. Making a database server external facing just a couple of mouse clicks. And most breaches in the cloud are due to users, i.e. clients, developers, making a mistake. Now what's good, what I like about cloud services is they really have integrated security controls into the service offering. Okay? So this, this one here is from Microsoft Azure. They've got the Azure Security Benchmark and they've got alignments to CIS, to NIST, to PCI. So they, they have predefined roles frameworks for certain services, uh, configuration options for say firewalls and segregation, they're, they're all there. So for the skilled cloud architect, cloud engineer, it makes it easy to build security in, security by design. So no longer do we have to think of what's done to build the system, then here's security layered on top. It's all part of the same process of building you can figure security in. Now the skills and capabilities of the, of the engineers is, is really critical and security people still need to come in and give a perspective on threats and risk, but uh, it's great to see uh, all the cloud service providers uh, basically r r really integrating security controls into their services. So how can internal audit help? So how can we help the CISO? So we, we're independent. Some people think, oh, you come along and tell us issues and give us more work to do. Well, sometimes that happens, but only if it's value added to the organization. So of course, we test controls for relevance and reliability. That's essential. We use misuse testing. We look at logs. We get into data analysis. We, 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 we really, really get in to find out it's effective. One thing we do is we validate the work that's been done. It could be the case, let's say the security organization had just completed a program to secure the operational technology environment. They may have spent tens of millions of pounds doing that 
and they said, job done. If we go in there and we find, yeah, you've done a really good job, all the controls are in place, they're all working, our report to the board will say, no issues found, a risk reduction has been achieved. That opinion is very valuable to the board. It tells them that their investment was well spent. That's what assurance is about. It's informing the board, informing the senior, senior executives that, yep, this has been done well, or this bit here is where the gaps are. We also work across departmental boundaries. So internal audits like a microcosm of the enterprise. Okay? So you take an end-to-end -end process like vulnerability management and software patching. You know, the one group will do the scanning, they'll pass it on to the server people, they'll try and patch, and the business application people might say, oh, you can't patch because my application won't work, etc. We can go across those departmental boundaries and look at the perspectives, understand the perspectives, and hopefully come out with a opinion that's balanced and, and, and reflective of, 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 of all, all the perspectives. Importantly, we'll provide insights uh, to the board and to everyone else. So what does good look like? So audit report uh, represents our opinion. And the two elements to our opinion, one is what is the current level of risk, two is how good is our control environment? What is management's awareness of the control environment? This is an example. So imagine the situation where, yep, there's lots of vulnerabilities, lots of security gaps, we've got a lot of work to do, we're running at a high risk. We're, be we're beyond what the risk appetite is for the organisation. But if the CISO organisation know about those issues, they've identified the gaps themselves, they put in place remediation programmes, they prioritise it. What that's telling us is that, yeah, you really understand your control environment. Sure, it may not be pretty, but you're on top of it. This is actually a good outcome. A bad outcome would be you've got high risks here and look, you've not identified the risks, you've not identified the controls. So th this, this, is what, this is what I'd say good looks like. Key takeaways. So in summary, our attack surface is distributed, diverse, and it's overwhelming. To address this, we need to move from full compliance to threat-based control selection. When it comes to controls, it's all about relevance, reliability, and reasonableness. Okay. Key takeaways, what you've learned today. Uh, next week, some suggestions. If you're in the security organisation, whatever, arrange to meet with your internal audit rep for cyber security. Give them a hug, if that's appropriate. But talk to them about controls. Talk to, them, talk to them about relevance, reliability, and reasonableness of controls. They can relate to that. They'll get you. They'll get you. Start using a risk, make, if you're not, not already doing so, you should always use a formal risk methodology. Not necessarily the right detail, but you should have the right terminology and right concepts. Within three months, create threat profiles of the likely threat actors and the motivations. Identify the high priority loss event scenarios for your organisation. Then start looking at the controls that best equipped to, deal, to, to respond to those threats. That's me. Thank you, everyone. I <laughs> I think we have some, so 10 minutes left for questions. There's two microphones there, and I'm also available afterwards if anyone has a question. I got a quick question. Please. How do you turn risk appetite? Oh. 
Great question. Well, it, it, come, it, comes from the, it comes from the board, and it's a balance between a, what the, what the organisation considers as material loss. Okay? And they balance that against organisational objectives. Okay? So a, a risk appetite, say material loss, what is acceptable? Worst case scenario, let's say it's 100 million pounds material loss so long as there's no patient safety impact, for example. Okay? It might not be comfortable, uh, but in, in a certain environment, maybe that's realistic. So it, 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 it does come down to what the board consider. We go back to that risk matrix. Okay, it's sort of a, if, if they define that an unacceptable risk would be something that hits 100 million pounds impact the company, that would really harm the company, or something that results in patients being harmed because of a cybersecurity incident that impacted their safety data. Maybe that, maybe that, that that's the sort of thing that that, that, would, that would be unacceptable. So uh, along, along those lines, a little, little bit nebulous, but a, a, in, in the real world, you have to think, well, if the impact is, say, 50 million pounds, maybe that's what we have to live with because you're never going to get it to zero. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one about KRI, key risk uh, indicator. Key risk indicators. Yes, how I should uh, identify them, evaluate them, then apply the policies and procedure to mitigate this KRI? Yeah, yeah, g g brilliant question. So once you've defined, you've identified your threats, you've identified controls that mitigate those threats, some of those controls are really, really important. Those are the ones you select as key risk indicators and, and measurements. So a good one, if you take, say, phishing, yes. a key risk indicator may be the click rate of the organization during phishing simulations. And you define threshold to say, well, okay, the benchmark for the industry is 5% click rate for a trained workforce. So our target would be to get less than that, and you monitor that going forward. It could be other things like a policy exceptions when upgrading operating systems. Okay, you may, may say, well, okay, due to some legacy technology, we have to live with unpatched, unpatchable operating systems. Okay, well, another indi key risk indicator would be, well, we'll, we'll keep, they keep watching that so it doesn't get out of control. So it's a percentage or a number. <coughs> uh, depending on your industry, if you've, if you've got a lot of external web-facing applications doing financial transactions, then a key risk indicator would be number of applications that have not had a web security test in three months, a successful one, for example. So it's all about identifying the most important controls for your business that address your, th address your threats and, and getting a measure for that. Second question. Uh, about special permission. Like, um, Sorry about? About the special uh, permission. For example, HR or finance uh, head department ask for special permission for one uh, employee. For example, to see the contracts or like um, salaries for the environment, uh, uh, what we call the organization. But uh, that employee uh, misused the, this permission and do like some pen testing or uh, information gathering for the network and other contracts. So how I can control this? So is, is this the case where you create an exception for one employee? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Exceptions are always gonna happen. There's always gonna be exceptions okay. and you should have an exception process. To me, exception is not a get out of jail free card. You know, there should be a, should be a compensating control in place. So the exception, you may say in that case, okay, I, you can get access to this, this data, but every time you need access, you have just the time access, your manager must approve it. Okay. So you think of some compensating control, okay? And it's very, so often people come and say, okay, I need an exception, it's important. You think, well, okay, 
what can you do to reduce this threat, to reduce this risk? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, quick question on uh, internal audit in relationship to uh, the threat appetite of the business. Does internal audit have, uh, have a requirement on it to base all of its judgments on the business's threat appetite, or does it have, uh, does it uh, more likely base its judgments on the risk at hand and let the business decide if it meets that, that appetite or not? Yeah, so there's kind of both. So, so internal audit will have, should have a good understanding of the threat appetite. Okay, that we're kind of close to the board, the, the audit and risk strategy and when we create an opinion uh, it, has, it, has, it has to be say, say it has to be balanced and proportionate okay and, and it's very difficult because in one situation let's say we created a risk where the system at risk is a patient safety system a system that's approving is testing drugs coming off a manufacturing line and approving their release into the supply chain the appetite there is tiny small, <laughs> very small, <laughs> okay. Uh, other, other situations, the financial, so it's about reasonableness, you know. We'll never get to an SAP system for enterprise resource planning. It'll never be risk three. There'll always be the risk of fraud or something going wrong. But it's about reasonable controls, okay. And sometimes, hopefully, if you've got the balance between protect, preventive controls and detective controls, you say, well, okay, I, if these ones fail, then hopefully we can, we can detect when something goes wrong. We do rely more and more on detective controls now. It's very much about being reasonable, and being reasonable depends on the, the impact, the actual harm that would be caused from a breach. So absolutely, audit. Or, or, or do need to take that. We, we do take that into account when we give our opinion. A question for you. So, um, what level of integration would you recommend for your internal audit department to have with just regular business processes, strategies, uh, areas such as that? And how much resources would you ded dedicate to it from an internal audit perspective? I think there's the there's always the boogeyman aspect of internal audit where there's a fear of getting them involved too early and then they're they're providing formal reports. So how do you balance that? Yeah. Um, yeah. where yeah. you're just providing feedback at that point and less so of a formal report um, and then how that goes into the, the audit universe yeah. and yeah, all yeah. the other aspects. We, we, we do that a couple of things. Uh, it's quite important for us to be close to the business strategies, to look at what business are doing, what digital solutions they're proposing. And we do play an advisory role as well. So 80, 90% of our work is audit. A small proportion of advisory work. We need to be careful we don't prescribe solutions. That's not our role, we're independent. But what we can say is, so somebody's building a, a new data analytics platform for a sensitive area on, in the cloud, let's say in GCP. We'll say, well, okay, so let's talk about the design. Now these are the controls we'd expect you to be have in place. So if, you've going, if you're going to have, say, 30 data engineers and 20 data scientists accessing all the set sensitive data, we'd expect you to have logging and monitoring in place to prevent exfiltration, to prevent unauthorized downloads. So we give that sort of input in terms of controls, control requirements and threat, and th then hopefully they, they, they build that in. It's a very useful process to get involved early as an advisory area, and the advisory is yeah, these are the sort of controls we'd expect. And hopefully they do it. And, and, and that's good because when we come back a year or two later and audit them, hopefully they've, they've done that. Yes, uh, one more question. Uh, regarding the example number two, about honest uh, employee. Yeah. So, like we did all the procedures and uh, we find, okay, user X or John or what's his name, um, someone use his uh, user credential, username and password and log into some data and take it that way. So like I'm now internal auditor, I found John who apply all of these th bad things. But how I can prove this is his, um, his behave or someone else? Ah, 
So this is a real case happened, so how I can prove it? Well, you, you, you'll do your best with the forensic analysis. <coughs> yes. But you're right, so if they're, uh, and, and, and unless one's based in UK, one's based in America, and you can say, well, <laughs> you, you can know the location wise, it couldn't have been this person. It could be very difficult. If someone's genuinely sharing passwords, I, that's bad. But you know what? You know what? I mentioned that thing about workforce training, employee training. Hopefully, people will report that, or at least say to them, look, stop it. That's against policy. I've been told to stop. I'm ha I'll be hanging around outside, happy to talk further. Thank you all. <laughs>